with the word of God in his hands, every human being, wherever his lot in life may be cast, may have such companionship as he shall choose. In its pages, he may hold converse with the noblest and best of the human race, and may listen to the voice of the Eternal as he speaks with men, as he studies and meditates upon the themes into which the angels desire to look, he may have their companionship. He may follow the steps of the heavenly teacher and listen to his words as when he taught on mountain and plain and sea. He may dwell in this world in the atmosphere of heaven, imparting to earth's sorrowing and tempted ones, thoughts of hope and longings for holiness himself coming closer and still closer into fellowship with the unseen like him of old who walked with god drawing nearer and nearer the threshold of the eternal world until the portal shall open and he shall enter there he will find himself no stranger the voices that will greet him are the voices of the holy ones voices who unseen were on earth his companions Voices that here he learned to distinguish and to love. He who through the word of God has lived in fellowship with heaven will find himself at home in heaven's companionship. Education, page 127, paragraph 1. God is good and all the time. The thought just came to me to encourage you and to urge you and to appeal to you and to plead with you. Make time for the writings of the servant of the Lord. She has told us those who neglect the testimonies will not stand in the last great trial. They just will not stand. And so uh, you may wonder, well, why does he recite from Ellen White? I'm trying to encourage people to develop a love for those writings that are such a blessing when they are read and reread. If you do not believe me, go back and read Steps to Christ. Amen. Particularly chapter 5. Someone wrote me a month ago and said, I have uncertainty about my relationship with God. And I said, do two things. Ask God to speak to you. I believe that's what I said. And number two, read Steps to Christ, paragraph five. I said, pray first. A couple of days later, I got a text from this person. I have never seen it so clearly. I have peace of mind. I thought I had to fix myself before coming to Christ. She said, my stress has fallen off. I see more clearly how Christ receives me. I won't burden you any further. If you want to read her writings, read them to your children. If you're a young person considering a relationship, read messages to young people and letters to young lovers. Wherever you are listening to me around the globe, if you're considering establishing a home, finish my words, read Adventist home. If you're thinking of bringing children into the world at this late stage in the world's history, finish my words, read child guidance. When you're considering educating your children, finish my words, read education. If you need counsel on managing your affairs, your funds, what should you read? Councils on stewardship. What does the Bible tell us in Second Chronicles 20, 12, 2020? Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Read the writings of the one God sent to this church as an inspired messenger. And I make this recommendation without hesitation, without fear, despite the fact that this servant of God is so widely unpopular. Because rebuke is always unpopular. How are you? Did I depress you? <laughs> well, how are you? Nice to see you. Do you love God, yes or no? Raise a hand. Mm -hmm. God likes that. I love God. I like him too. I walk around the house all day saying, Jesus, I love you. <laughs> I love God. He's my friend. I let him down sometimes. I do. Don't tell anyone. But he's my friend. 
God is a nice person. Jesus is a nice man. He's also God, but as a human being, he's a nice man. He really is. And he loves you. Individually. He loves you as if no one else is alive on the face of the earth. Steps to Christ, page 100, paragraph 1. The relations between God and each soul is as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care. Not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. God, when you pray, God listens as if no one else is praying. You can't get that attention from Biden. Sometimes not from your spouse. But you get it, finish my words, from God. Somebody say amen for God. Uh, Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. He really is. A ah, nice God. All right. That's why we're alive. If he weren't nice, we'd all be dead. And we'd all deserve it. Is anyone present who's not a Seventh-day Adventist? Raise your hand. So, oh, you have a handsome man. Stand up, please. Just stand. We're nice people. Don't be afraid. What's your name? Stand up, son. David. Oh, I have a friend called David Williams, an outstanding scholar. Have you been before, David? Did I welcome you? Okay, thank you for coming. Would you kindly tell us who invited you? Your mother-in-law, where well, you had no choice. All right, well, it's nice to see you. It's nice to see you, Dr. David. But you don't go against your mother-in-law if you want to live long. Well, it's nice to see you. God bless you, a double blessing on your mother-in-law. And there must be a wife somewhere if you have a mother-in-law. All right. Anyone else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Anyone else? Okay. If there are guests at the other family churches, thank you very much. I think that's the camera over there. Where is it? Right here. And God bless you for joining us. I will ask you now to please preserve reverence where you are, particularly if you're in your homes. Monitor your children. Let them know the word of God is about to be ministered. God must be respected. Two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, what? Put your words in that man's mouth. It is a serious responsibility to occupy your pulpit because eternal life is at stake. Error may drive people down the road to perdition. I don't, I've told God before, I prefer to die than deliberately preach error. I've told him that and I mean it. Put me to sleep, but do not let me stand in a pulpit and deliberately preach error just to keep the offerings coming. Mm -mm. So you ask God, put his words in my mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the, Say it with me. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And that's what I want to speak. And favor number three, I want you to think. You are made in the image of God through Adam. God has given us a mind that separates us from the animal kingdom. We are required to think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. What a beautiful privilege to sit down with God and reason, even though we're almost always unreasonable, God is willing to listen. And when we finished ranting and raving, he tells us, this is the way, walk ye in it. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, your son, our savior. When we come in his name, dear God, we come in the name of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. We come in the name of the one who said, let there be light. In the name of the one who said to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We come in the name of the one who raised himself from the dead. We come in the name of Jesus, who said, I and my Father are one. In this holy, mighty name we bow, asking you forgive us if we've offended you. Grant us an infilling of your spirit, a brand new infilling, Father, that he may guide our minds as we listen to your word. I humble myself before you. If I've offended you, forgive me. I am dirt, dear God, I am clay. Forgive me and grant me your spirit to direct my thinking and consequently my speaking. Let my words glorify your name. You deserve it, Father. Your word says in Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another. 
So you take it, God, all of it. But please, grant us the blessing because we need them. Now, Father, bless those who are listening wherever they are, especially our guests and the little children, boys and girls. Remember those who've contracted COVID-19 right where they are, Father. Place your hand of merciful healing upon them, God, and restore them to full health. I commit this service to your glory. Guide it, I pray, from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us go to John 16. It's 740 on the dot. I'll release you by 815. Is that too long? Okay. What book did I say? John, what chapter? 16, reading from what verse? 7, and I'll read from the King James Version of the Bible. And for those of you who feel so inclined, you may read with me. John 16, reading from verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus. He is the truth, and he tells us the truth. It is expedient for you that I go. In other words, it is to your advantage. God always acts for our advantage. And the greatest proof of that is Calvary. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of three things. Tell me what they are. Of sin and of judgment and of righteousness. You see, the problem is sin. The solution, the righteousness of Christ. And there will be a judgment to determine who goes down or who goes up. Very basic. Verse 9, read with me, of sin because they believe, not on me, of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now, let's go back to 9, 8 and 9. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, he comments on each one in verses 9, 10, and 11. Of sin, finish that verse, because they believe not on me. It's a crime against divinity to doubt God. We are familiar with crimes against humanity. It is a crime against divinity to doubt God. God. Let me show you how horrible it is. Go to 1 John chapter 5. We read verse 10. Well, let's read 9 and 10. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. First John towards the back of the Bible. Do you have it? What chapter? 5. What verses? 9 and 10. Are you there? Read with me. If we receive, come on, the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his son. Now very carefully, verse 10. He that, start again, he that believeth on the son, come on, hath the witness in himself. Keep reading. He that believeth not, come on, hath made him a liar. Why? Because he hath not believed what? that God gave of his son. We make God a liar when we doubt his word. Our subject, a crime against divinity. He that believeth on the son hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not hath made him a liar because hath not believed in the testament, the record that God gave of his son. To disbelieve God is to call him a liar. Now, if we call God a liar by unbelief, who are we calling a truth teller? You see, if I, by my behavior, call God a liar, I am calling Satan a truth teller because one is truth, one is lies. Listen to John 8 44. Go there with me. Our subject a crime against divinity. John 8. Verse 44, some very harsh words from Christ, but sometimes harsh words have saving value. But don't make it a habit. John 8, verse 44, are you there? Read with me, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. 
he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Keep reading. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Christ is clear, the liar is Satan. Did you see that in the verse? Who is the liar? Then when we, by our unbelief, call God a liar, <laughs> what are we calling God without saying it? I won't even say it. I'll let you think. Jesus says the liar is Satan. 1 John 5.10 says, when we don't believe God's testimony, we make him a liar. Then we're saying that God is really... Mm -hmm. We don't say it. But there's no need to say it. Our attitudes do. A crime against humanity, against divinity, is to disbelieve the word of God. Let us go to Genesis 1, my favorite book. By the way, what's your favorite book? Matthew. All right, Brother Matthew. He used to be a thief, then he met Jesus, and he wrote the first gospel. All those tax collectors were thieves. What's your favorite book? Revelation. Who? Oh, Roman. Oh, you must be a Bible scholar. Romans. Okay. What's your favorite book, my lovely sister? Who? Oh, Romans. Okay, okay. All right. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. Let's pray again. God of heaven and earth. God of truth, whose spirit is truth, whose son is truth. Help us to love truth that we may be children of the truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read verse 1 of Genesis 1 without looking down. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's think. Sometimes in the Bible, heaven and earth means everywhere. Go to Matthew 28 without losing Genesis 1. Matthew 28 Read verse 18. I just said sometimes heaven and earth means everywhere. Matthew 28, reading verse 13. Not 13, sorry, verse 18. Do you have that? Read with me. Come on, read verse 18 of Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying what? All power is given unto me. Where? In heaven and in earth. Now think with me. How much power is given unto Jesus? All. Where? Question for you. Is there a place where Jesus has no power? No. Then what does heaven and earth mean in that verse? Everywhere. Now in Genesis 1, it means the heavens connected to the earth, our solar system. Because there was a place where angels lived before this earth was made. Are you following me? So the entire universe wasn't made in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1, but it doesn't change the fact that it was made by God. Now, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He made the entire universe. That tells us what he did. When you see it, if you've ever been to a, is it called, what's that national park that has the oldest trees in the world? Huh? No, it's in California or somewhere on the west coast. Big trees that rise to hundreds of feet. The sequoia tree, where is that? Oh, sequoia national park, all right. There's, there's a tree somewhere, it's about 5,000 years old. If you cut that tree down, you see a lot of rings. That's how they date trees. You know who allows trees to live? Be more specific in the name. Jesus. Have you ever seen a bird fly? You know who created the laws of flight? Jesus. You're blinking your eyes as you look at me. You cannot blink your eye unless you lose muscular contraction. And that requires electrical impulses. Do you know who set that in place? Jesus. I love going to the ocean. I don't swim well, but I love to go to the ocean and splash. Huh? <laughs> you don't drown when you splash. The waves come in. Do they come in, yes or no? Yes. Then what do they do? 
Go back up. Who put that law in place? Jesus. The Bible says, thus far and no further. By the way, the waves obey better than we do. The internal system of the body, great mystery. All the organs, all the systems, they function by Jesus Christ. Now, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, everything in it. That's what he did. Question now is how? How? Go to verse 3, quickly, of Genesis 1. Read verse 3 for me. And God said, stop. I talk about this all the time. And God said. Do you have God said in your hand? What do you mean? Why are you hesitating? Do you have God said in your hand? Show it to me. This. How was the entire universe created? By this. Not by ink and paper. By the word. Listen to Education, page 126, paragraph 4. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will. Received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. Who is the infinite one? God. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. This word brings to us the very life of God. Let the Bible establish that. Go to Genesis 1. Let's read from verse 11. What's our subject? A crime against divinity. We're reading from verse 11 of Genesis 1. It's nine minutes to eight. Let's pray, Father, as I talk about your word, which you have magnified above your name in Psalm 138, verse 2. Give me clarity of speech and humility of heart, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Read verse 11 with me. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed. Now stop. What's in the seed? Life. Go to verse 29. Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed the seed is what produces the tree because there is the principle of life in the seed put there by god and call forth by god now are trees living things yes or no yes is grass a living thing yes do they have a kind of life yes can grass die? Yes. Do trees die? Yes. When it's hot, does your lawn shrivel up and die? Yes, because they have life. Anything that lives, lives by the power of God. Anything that lives. And the power of God is mediated through his word. Go to Hebrews 1. Let's read verse 3. Let's read from verse 1. Of Hebrews 1. Our subject, a crime against divinity. Do you have Hebrews 1? Reading from verse 1. Keep going, keep going. All right, somebody found it. Okay. All right, let's read. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now read very carefully. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So the Father told the Son, you create. Now verse 3 carefully. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things how? By the word of his power or his powerful word. The verse says the creator which is Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. Go now to Colossians 1. Keep all things in your mind and go to Colossians 1. We read 16, 17, our subject, a crime against divinity. Colossians, not far from Hebrews, just go to the left. 
a few books, you should run into Colossians. Who wrote Colossians? Brother Paul, a busy man, a powerful preacher. Tradition says he was short, bow legged and bald headed That's how he's described in secular writings, not in the Bible. Colossians 1, reading from verse 16. Read with me now. For by him were all things created. Stop. We have the expression all things. Do you see it there? All right. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. You cannot see without this creative word of God sustaining the laws of sight. Are you with me? Everything God does, he does through his word. Go to Matthew 8. Other than yourself, who is your greatest enemy? Satan. All right. Matthew 8. And when I say other than yourself, I wasn't joking. If the devil dies right now, we will still sin. Hmm? We don't sin because there's a devil. We sin because we have a nature that leans that way and we choose not to seek spiritual power. If we do not sin because the devil tempts us. I'm not promoting temptation. I'm simply saying sin is a choice we make. What book did I say? Which one? Matthew 8, let's read verse 16. Are you there? Read with me. And when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed, how? With devils. Keep reading. And he cast out the spirits, how? With his word. Now, what does that teach you? Your weapon against the devil is the word. If it was the weapon for Jesus, how can you use a different weapon? We have to learn to rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ and by his word. Now we've discovered that the word Christ used is that the weapon Christ used is the word. Now let's look at a part of the mission of Christ. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Our subject, a crime against divinity. Four minutes to eight. 1 John chapter 3. We were there earlier. This is the same person who wrote the Gospel of John and who wrote Revelation, by the way. Same person. He wrote five books. The Gospel of John, Revelation, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st John 3, 8. Read with me. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Finish the verse. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, what is the weapon that Jesus uses? The word. I want you to look at that verse. One of the purposes Christ came into the world is to destroy the works of the devil. Question for you, but don't answer me. Is the devil working in your life? Don't answer me. You want him out? Mm -hmm. Studied and obeyed. Not recited like Mary had a little lamb. Mm -mm. Studied and obeyed. The power of the word is released in obedience. But obedience is merely the expression of faith. Are you, are you listening to me? Obedience is merely the expression. When I go to the dentist and he tells me, sit down, I sit down. I don't ask him why. I sit down. Then he leans the chair all the way back and I'm like this. I, I'm in a coffin. You open your mouth, I open my mouth. He says, bite down. I bite down. I've never said why. Never said why. One, once in a while I go to my chiropractor to make sure things are in order. Because I love to lift weights. You need to check your body. And she tells me, uh, raise a knee. I raise a knee. She says, resist. I resist. She said, turn over face down. I turn over face down. I've never asked her why. Because she has a certificate on the wall. Are you listening to me? She has a certificate on the wall from an accredited school. I go to the mechanic. He says, pop the hood. I pop the hood. God says, keep the Sabbath. We say, no. Why? Why? 
Now God says, listen to me. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not a chiropractor. I'm not a, I am God. I made the chiropractor. I made the mechanic. I made the dentist. Keep my Sabbath. No, why? But everybody loves Jesus. This is the weapon against the enemy. Its power is released in obedience. What's our subject? A crime against divinity. To doubt the word of God. I, uh, I love to talk about the word of God. When Christ comes back the second time, go to 1 Thessalonians 4. It's 8 o'clock on the dot. When did I say I'd release you? How many have to go to work? Can I see your hand? Nobody? <laughs> All right. That's not a threat. I'll finish by 8.15. What book did I say? First what? Chapter. Reading verse. Whenever an Adventist preacher goes to 1 Thessalonians 4, you can guess what verse he's reading. What verse is that? 16. That's right. <laughs> You can just guess and be right. 16. Well, since you guessed the first, say it without looking. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Come on. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now look closely at that verse. The Lord himself. I like that, by the way. He's not sending someone for us. Someone sends an Uber to pick you up, not Christ. The Lord is coming for you. That tells you how he thinks of you. Are you with me? All right. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. How? With a shout. But God does not make noises. God utters words. Ah, you missed what I said. The word shout doesn't mean God just, hey. Mm -mm. When God speaks, he utters words. But he utters the word so loud, the writer says a shout. Are you with me? But it's a word. With a shout. Keep reading. With the voice of the archangel. That's another description of what the shout is like. It's the word he speaks. With the trump of God. It's like the sound of a trumpet. In other words, when he comes, he says something. But it's loud. Now listen to this verse, but don't go this. Listen. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice. Lazarus. Finish the verse. Come forth. Verse 44 of John 11 says, And he that was bound hand and foot came forth. Where was Christ when he raised Lazarus? In the tomb? Outside the tomb. Where was Lazarus? In the tomb. Did Christ touch him? No. What did Christ do? He spoke. Then there must be life, come on, in the word. In a way we do not understand. Now, this is the man who raised Lazarus. When he raised this, the widow's son, Nain, he touched the coffin, not the boy. Mm -hmm. Now, he can touch you if he wants, but the word of God does not require a touch. He just said, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came to him. Now, listen to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the word for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Jesus comes, shouts from the heaven, and all righteous dead people get up. That is the power of the word of God. Now, go to Ephesians 5. Now let me speak to those who are spiritually dead in this building and online. How did Jesus raise Lazarus? You tell me. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He came forth. Now, we're talking to the spiritually dead. Ephesians 5, read for me verse 14. Clearly and carefully. What does it say? Wherefore he saith what? Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and christ shall give thee life now this is spoken to those spiritually dead and if someone receives that word into the heart that person will come from the spiritual death as lazarus came from the physical death 
awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Jesus virtually told Lazarus, arise from the dead. When he said, come forth. When those words are received, someone is brought to life spiritually and so ephesians 2 verse 1 says you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins how by the quickening word of god and so jesus tells us in john 6 63 it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing the words that i speak unto you finish the verse they are spirit and they are life the very life of god is in his word and to belittle the word is to belittle God listen to what Samuel told Saul then I'll let you go first Samuel 15 let's go to verse 22 and 20 verses 22 and 23 first Samuel 15 22 and 23 and I'll close sermon should be short on Saturday night 1 Samuel 15, 22, 23. You have that? I'll give you 10 more seconds to find it. 1 Samuel. First Samuel is the first of the great prophets. But who was the very first prophet? In the Bible, the very first. You're talking too softly, I can't hear you. Who is the very first prophet in the Bible? Nope. Good guess, but no. Who? Can't hear my handsome brother. Okay, Enoch. First prophet. Yes. First Samuel 15, 22, 23. Let me pray. Father, I'm closing now, but continue to help me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to what Samuel tells Saul after Saul disobeyed God. Are you with me? Read with me. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Keep reading. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of ram. Verse 23, now go on. For rebellion is as a sin of, and idolatry as, and stubbornness as idolatry and, now, and iniquity. Finish the verse. Because thou hast, rejected the word of God, he also hath rejected thee. Mm -hmm. You reject this, you've rejected me. There are people in church who have rejected God, but they come to church every Sunday. When you reject, thus saith the Lord, you reject God. Because that's the name of Jesus. Revelation 19.13 And he was clothed in a vesture dipped with blood and his name is called the Word of God. John 1 verse 1 In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Verse 14 And the Word became was made flesh and dwelt among us. When you say no to truth, you say no to God. The Bible says in Proverbs 8.36, all they that hate me love death. I offer to you tonight the word of God. Let me close with this passage. Go to John 6 quickly. John 6. We'll read a long passage and I close. It's uh, 8.08. I promise let's go by 8.15, but if the spirit touches me, I may have to go to 8.20. Are you with me? All right. So blame the spirit, not me. John 6 from verse 51. You have that? Are you there? Read with me. What does it say? I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You notice we have the word life and living occurs several times between verse 51 and, and further down. Almost nine, ten times. He's talking about life. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They misunderstood the words of Christ. And misunderstanding is a di very di dangerous thing. It leads to all kinds of cat catastrophic behavior. But they misunderstood because they were listening with carnal mind, not with a mind to see the beauty of truth that saves. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, finish the verse, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, verse 54, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Keep reading. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Keep reading. This is that bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread, come on, shall live forever. Now read verse 59. These things said he in the synagogue, come on, as he taught in Capernaum. Now, read the next verse. Many of his disciples, therefore, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? This is tough, they said. A lot of people walk out of churches because they don't like what's being preached. So the preacher says, you should not live with a woman, not your wife. Then you get up and walk out. Walking out on a preacher does not change the truth. Are you following me? Are you? Ah, come on, you don't like me anymore. Walking out on a preacher does not change the truth. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. This is rough stuff. Who can hear it? Verse 61. Read with me. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? You know, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the Sabbath offends many people. Mm -hmm. It offends people because it interferes with custom. Christ describes a sad situation in Luke 5, 37 to 39. And I'll apply it to why many people reject the seventh-day Sabbath, which is Bible truth. Go to Luke 5 quickly. The Spirit just told me to go there. Now let me go quickly without rushing. Luke 5, 37 to 39. A crime against divinity. Do you have that? Luke was a medical doctor. He was not uh, one of the 12 disciples. He's the only non-Jewish writer in the Bible. Are you there now? Read with me, and no man, did I tell you the verses 37 to 39? Read with me, and no man put his new wine, come on, in old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, carefully, verse 39. No man also, having drunk old wine, straightly desireth new for he saith, finish the verse, the old is better. Now, this is sad. The new wine means the doctrines Christ brought, which the Pharisees could not accept because their hearts weren't changed. So Christ's new wine teachings had no effect upon them. Listen to verse 39. No man also, having drunk old wine, straightly desireth the new. Let me put it in simple language. When you've been brought up on error, your initial reaction to truth is very often very, very negative. One of the great tragedies of society is something called recidivism. Recidivism. A brother goes to jail, anybody goes to jail, talk about the men. Spends eight, ten years, you let him out, he goes right back. Because he's become accustomed to that life. You let him out again, he goes right back. It's called recidivism. He doesn't have to work. Three meals a day. He can play, he, whatever. He goes right back. It's a sad situation. When you've grown up in error and you see truth, you tremble you, because you realize, I'm losing the comfort of what I'm accustomed to, but it is wrong. Yes, it's wrong, but I'm accustomed. And when you're accustomed, you're comfortable. And Jesus said, no man, verse 39, Luke 5, having drunk new wine, having drunk old wine, straightly desireth new. For he saith, the old is better. He said, that's what my grandfather did and my father. That's what my tribe did. That's what this community does. That's what this parish does. How can I change that? Truth is not automatically loved. Are you following me? Because truth goes contrary to the carnal nature. Let's go back to John 6. 
Verse 62, 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Of course, they were offended. Now read verse 66 carefully for me. Come on, read it. What does it say? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why did they leave? They did not like what he said. Now, then said Jesus unto the twelve, verse 67, Will he also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Come on, finish it. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Now, Peter is saying, we are staying for this reason. You preach, come on, the truth. And he calls them the words of eternal life. You join a church because of what it teaches. Not because the members are nice. Because the place to find hypocrites is not a casino. Finish my words. It's in the church. Ah, you stop listening. Uh, let me go home. The place to find hypocrites is the church. Not the bar and the strip club. So if you're coming to the church looking for perfect people, you've come to the wrong place. You come looking for, thus saith the Lord. Are you with me? And so Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? That's why I've always said, if I were to leave the Adventist church, I couldn't join another church. I'd just go into the world and drink and smoke and whatever, jump off cliffs and whatever. Are you following me? <laughs> go to another church for what? Having learned what I've learned and have been taught. We are staying because you speak the words of life. You don't have a church building, but you preach the truth. Your members don't drive cars, but you preach the truth. You don't have a fancy pipe organ, but you've preached the words of life. We have to learn how to reduce life to the bare essentials, and that is truth. And to reject it is a crime against humanity. How can you doubt someone who said, let there be light, and the light came? And then you doubt him? That's an insult. Insult. That's why we call him a liar. Or that's how we call him a liar. Let me ask you quickly. It's 816. Forgive me. 816. How many will say, Lord, increase my love for the truth? Can I see your hand? Mm -hmm. Stand up with me. Please. Now, I want two short prayers. Short. I want one from this side. One from that side, I'll pray. Let's all kneel.